quite by accident I've come across the explanation how is it that negative resistance occurs. That's a fancy term for what only happens regarding the use of gases and an arc or spark gap occurring across two electrodes through the medium of a gas. And it's explained ever so adroitly by William Lyne, of all people, when he talks about atomic hydrogen on his webpage um, devoted to the subject. He talks about hydrogen welding torches that have become obsolete, we're told, by processes that are actually inferior. And he's saying that monoatomic hydrogen has more energy potential than does diatomic hydrogen. And the same thing is true for other gases, not just the hydrogen, helium. Um, which is interesting because it brings up a question, well, isn't this what um, Stanley Meyer was working with? Disassociating diatomic nitrogen in the air into its monoatomic state purely by voltage um, ionization, 70,000 volts uh, positive ionization was used by uh, Herman Anderson. Um, which doesn't consume any wattage because it's strictly volts that separates the dinitrogen apart at 70,000 volts. And when ionized positively, it can combine with monoatomic hydrogen to form ammonia, which then can be um, combusted in the internal combustion engine in our cars to produce air and, wa and water. And practically free energy because all it costs is the water that you put in the tank and the um, air that your air intake takes in. Well here, William Lyne seems to be explaining how a gas discharge tube is a negative resistor. And if there's some other instance in nature which is a negative resistor, um, I don't know any examples. It, the, ne you know, the examples given in Wikipedia were only gas discharge tubes exhibiting a behavior that was the reciprocal of Ohm's law, in which Ohm's law was turned upside down, in which the normal Ohm's relationship of voltage divided by friction equals speed, or pressure divided by friction equals speed, becomes its reciprocal in the negative of um, friction divided by pressure equals speed. And that doesn't say why, though. It's just a mathematical relationship. It doesn't say why. Well, William Lyne says that it, the, the whole task of using hydrogen, monoatomic hydrogen, to, you know, created by electrolysis, which could be done, you know, that way, to make your own monoatomic hydrogen from water using just voltage, um, when blown through between two electrodes, you know, a spark gap, and, a, and an arc goes across the gap in the presence of monoatomic hydrogen, the energy is tremendous and cannot be accounted for by the hydrogen atom in any of its states, or nor by a combustion. And where did all that energy come from? Plus, you get to reuse the hydrogen all over again. So where did the energy come from? It came from somewhere else. And that's the only way to explain it, which sounds like the principle of the lever. Because, you know, what did Archimedes say? Give me a lever and I will move the world. Well, give me a gas and I will use its monoatomic state to liberate energy from somewhere else other than the gas itself. And that's the only way to properly define a gas discharge tube's negative resistance. Why is it behaving anomalously. And then, of course, the next question will be, well, why is it that it can, uh, an electrical circuit can be, it can be constructed in such a way 
that the negative resistance of a tiny little neon bulb can have its negative resistance imparted, it's that characteristic shared and, and imposed upon the rest of the circuit, which in the case of Barbosa and Leal includes the earth and the load, so that the whole circuit becomes a negative resistor. I mean, that's the only way for negative resistors to work, otherwise they'd be quenched by the positive resistance of everything else. They'd be overwhelmed. But in order to get any benefit, they'd have to overwhelm the circuit somehow. And apparently, the other thing interesting, that the, what little I got out of the Wikipedia article was that negative resistance only happens over voltage differences that are measured over time. They don't have anything to do with static voltage references, which only has to do with DC continuous uh, voltage anyway. It has nothing to do with pulsed DC, because that varies over time, or AC, which also varies over time. So obviously, the gas discharge tube example will be able to operate just as I suspected in Barbosa and Leal. It'll either operate under the AC influence or under pulsed DC, and work just fine in both but it cannot be continuous DC, and that was something left out of Patrick Kelly's analysis or somebody else's who said, oh, they quoted the, the inventors, Barbosa and Lila, saying, well, DC is also possible, not just AC. Um, they never said what kind of DC, but if you've got transformers, the only way to use DC is a changing state of magnetic field, which can only be induced by pulsing the DC. You can't have continuous DC, or using AC, which, you know, changes direction, or however you want to define AC. <laughs> I've gotten into arguments with people over that. So, the argument being that the only way to look at AC properly is that everybody driving down the road on the right-hand side of the road in America all of a sudden have to drive on the left-hand side and back again to the right-hand side and back and forth, back and forth every 120th of a second, while in Europe it's every 100th of a second. <laughs> so to say that, you know, the British are wrong by driving on the left side of the road, well, forget it, AC, you have to switch sides anyway. <laughs> but it does not reverse direction. The electricity never does that. It simply changes which wire it rides down. So by changing which wire it rides down, it never has to exert any energy by changing direction, which would be a loss of energy efficiency. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> Yet, I got into an argument with somebody over uh, defining AC. Oh, it changes direction alternately. No, it doesn't. You would lose. It would be a waste of energy. I didn't even bring that up. I should have. <laughs> Anywho. So, but a changing magnetic field is what a gas discharge tube is predicated upon the requirement of. It cannot run off of strictly DC continuous current, no matter what else can be said. And if the voltage is high enough, and through the use of oscillations, I think that's why we have to have a continuous loop somewhere in the circuit, so that the voltage has a chance to rise. And if it has the characteristic ability to accumulate and thus rise, then the gas discharge tube can further its magnanimous <laughs> agenda along by spreading itself around the entire circuit. But if, there's n there, if there isn't this... <coughs> sorry. Without the ability to accumulate voltage in an oscillating circuit by use of a closed loop, there's no way for the negative resistance to spread itself around. And so whether it's, whether it's Barbosa and Leal's electric keeper or capture loop, whatever it's called, or whether it's Eric Dollar's LMD module, it doesn't matter. It amounts to the same thing. A closed loop that allows voltage to accumulate and build because it's an oscillator. A closed loop is an inherent oscillator. So there has to be two elements here. One is the gas discharge tube, or a spark gap, actually. One is a spark gap, because that's what a gas discharge tube is. It's a spark gap in, uh, arcing across a gaseous medium. So one is a spark gap in a gaseous medium, and the other is a closed loop. 
and, and between those two, the whole circuit becomes a negative resistor. And the negative resistor is just a obfuscation terminology, probably invented by the, <laughs> the hiders of truth, when in reality uh, it's just a leveraging, an act of leveraging energy from somewhere other than the gaseous medium and somewhere from other than the electricity that creates the arc across the gap through that gaseous medium. It's merely a process that's using energy from somewhere else because there's no energy in the gas or in the electrical arc to account for what happens. It's just not there. And yet, despite that, Wikipedia says that Ohm's law is turned upside down. They don't say it, but they do provide the information there for you to make up your own mind along those lines. And that's what I've done, and so what, I've see, what I see here is that if the mathematical relation is correct, then reality gets turned upside down because the whole nature of friction gets redefined. Instead of something that's always implied as something that slows you down and hurts you and makes life more miserable, instead it's your assistant, it's your helper, and it, it actually speeds you along even faster, accelerates you along even faster than you've ever gone before in your life. And so you better look out and hold on because you're going to have a ride that you might not even return from. You might not even uh, come to a, a, stall, a, a halt from. So negative resistor is not even the right phrase. Because William Lyne is saying the energy is coming from somewhere else. It's not coming from the process, nor from the medium. You know, the, the combined uh, attrib attributes of the gas involved, nor the electric electrical arc that jumps through it, nor the uh, electrodes, for that matter, that they jumps off and leaps back onto, or whatever. It's just not there. And yet it happens every time lightning bolt. You know, a lightning bolt is nothing more than a sparking gap. And so it's a mystery what it is that, that the spark gap is relying on through a gas. What is it relying on for its energy? Because it's not itself. It's just a means to an end. And that must be the only way I can define it because that's the only way that makes any sense, I guess. I mean, nobody's coming up with anything better than what I've seen here with William Lyne. I'm halfway down the page. Um, but that's basically what he's saying. It's the energy is coming from somewhere else. You know, he says it, he's, he gives it a name, but it doesn't matter if we don't even, if we don't have access, if we don't know how to get the energy directly ourselves and we have to do it through a sparking gap, then it's as good as saying it comes from the voodoo, you know, because it's not something that we can directly access. But if it's something we can indirectly access by using a process, and a very standard process at that, a little neon bulb, a little fluorescent tube, uh, a monoatomic hydrogen welding arc, a helium welding arc, I mean, it's not like it's voodoo. It's very commonplace in some respects, even though monoatomic hydrogen welding torches have been made, have been forced to become obsolete. There's no reason for them to become obsolete. It's just not commercially viable to give somebody the ability to create all the hydrogen, hyd um, all the arcing they want uh, using a hydrogen that they can make from water if they need to, if they can't, you know, take the trouble to recycle what they just used. Um, and it's 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 it would stand to reason that. We're a throwaway society. We know, we know that. It's, we're called a throwaway society, a consumer-oriented society in which we're not really allowed to recycle a whole lot. Just enough to make us feel like we're doing our duty, but in reality we're recycling very little. And fr free energy methodologies are at the heart of what we've thrown away that recycles because we're, we're recycling energy and the materials to create it. Um, we're definitely a, cons a throwaway society. We're, everything produced is intended to be thrown away. 
And that's why free energy is also has to be thrown away. It's very amazing. So you won't see oscillating subsystems in a circuitry that involves a neon bulb or a fluorescent tube. In fact, quite the opposite. Quite the opposite, because the last thing they want is a free energy device coming from your CFL, your your uh, what is the C Com compressed fluorescent lamp? What is that called? Uh, CFL bulb? I don't even know what the CFL stands for anymore. Anyway, I couldn't help but share this with you. Um, it was quite by accident. I got this email from a logging source or something. Uh, a message board or something that I subscribed to a long time ago and William Lines uh, responded and uh, then I remembered, oh wait a minute, don't I have his uh, contact information or at least some of it and in there I had this web page and he's got a whole website that he still maintains out of his pocket devoted to this very subject and there it is if you want to go see it <clears throat> so, um, here, let's see what the front page looks like. Let's go let's see, let's see, let's back up a little bit. <clears throat> Sometimes I just don't bother to use my stand because I'm not too interested in being a great videographer. Instead, I'm just a sloppy one. So here's the home page. Enter. Oh my god, he uses the tornado just like the same picture I use. Oh my god, <laughs> for Charles Chandler. Look at that, there it is. There she blows, mate, there she blows. Unlimited energy in the air. 5.5 .5 quadrillion tons of air. Self-replenishing. <clears throat> So we have an index, home, and different buttons. <laughs> Upton Sinclair, Tesla, Arthur Schopenhauer, astonishing quantity. I'm going to have to read through this website. This, this should be interesting. Is that where you enter? Yeah, it's the same place. Cowabunga. So this is going to be interesting. I'm going to have to read. This is where I need to learn about negative resistance of a spark gap. He's got it all here. So this is where we find out about, <coughs> about um, free energy that Barbosa and Lille predicates its energy upon the use of a little neon bulb. This is where it's at. If you want to understand, well, uh, why is it? Well... William Lyons seems to have figured it out. Cowabunga. I always like things larger so I can read them. <laughs> there. So I'm going to have some reading ahead for me. Um, well, what more can I say? That's the way to go about this, is to understand it in, in these terms, that William understands it, because he did the homework in a truthful, because he's a truthful, honest guy. He doesn't make up stories. I don't know why anybody thinks he does. And I, I'm still confused over his uh, water meter experiment, but, you know, I may never figure that one out. But he's already covered gas discharge tube arcing. And he's quite thoroughly, he did the math. I remember reading through that webpage several years ago. He did the math and he figured out where the obfuscation occurs and why monoatomic hydrogen arc uh, welding torches are not in common use because the en en energy has been confused, it's been obscured to the point of it's no wonder we would uh, you know, discard it because we wouldn't understand something that's been smeared, a smear campaign of truth, smearing truth, a campaign to smear truth into oblivion. Anywho, um, enough said, really. Sorry for the coughing. I'll get over this cold. <laughs> and be healthy, I hope. For a little while, anyway. <laughs>